hello fellow followers of Christ and welcome to the show that introduces you to the men and women behind history's greatest works of literature. Come along every week as we explore these renowned authors, the times and genre in which they wrote, why scholars praise their writing and how we as Catholics should read and understand their works. I'm Joseph Pierce and this is the authority. Hello and welcome to this episode of The Authority, where we actually come today to one of the greatest authorities in all of literature, arguably the greatest poet ever. And we're talking about the great Dante from Italy uh, and the author, of course, of the Divine Comedy. So um, Dante was was born in 1265, um, in the latter half of the 13th century, and died in 1321. So he coincides with the high Middle Ages and what some people might uh, consider to be the golden age of, 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 of the church and of Catholicism. Certainly, it was a golden age of philosophy. Uh, he, was a, he was basically um, um, around at the same time as uh, shortly after Thomas Aquinas, um, this great uh, angelic doctor, as he's known. Um, this golden age of, of Christian philosophy, of, of scholasticism and Christian theology uh, is the age of Gothic architecture. You know, there were also problems. It's, you know, I, I'm sometimes reminded when people say that the um, the, uh, the 13th or the 14th century is the time of Dante was, uh, was the golden age, uh, or sometimes it's called the best of centuries. There was a historian called uh, Father Walsh who wrote a book and it's called The Best of Centuries. I'm sometimes tempted to to, re, to um, respond with the opening sentence of of uh, Charles Dickens's novel, uh, A Tale of Two Cities. It was the best of times. It was the worst of times because there were bad things going on as well, as, as always in the whole of human history. As St. Augustine tells us, it's a struggle between the city of God and the city of man in every generation. There's not a golden age in that sense, but certainly it was a great age with great things happening. Uh, and one of the greatest was this great poem. So Dante was exiled from Florence. He was involved, embroiled in the internecine politics of Florence, his home, his hometown, his home city, and was, if you like, on the losing side of, the, of what you might call a political civil war there, and was forced into exile and spent the remainder of his life in exile. So from 1301 for the last 20 years of his life. So although he was already had a great reputation as, as a poet, uh, especially for uh, a series of poems called Vita Nuova, uh, The New Life, where he introduces us to his love, Beatrice, this great love of his life. And we'll obviously be saying more about her as we discuss the Divine Comedy. Um, but it's really his masterpiece is the Divine Comedy. And he writes that in exile. He writes that as an exile. And indeed, some of the politics of the poem, which we won't be concerning ourselves with primarily today, um, is... Um, is connected, if you like, to the bitterness of 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 the contemporary situation, the uh, the loneliness of the exile, uh, the melancholy that goes with that, the anger that goes with that. So that's a backdrop, but it's a political backdrop, and it's not the most important part of the poem. So we are going to look at the Divine Comedy now, uh, and we have to understand that. Uh, Dante is, in many respects, a disciple, uh, obviously, of Christ. He's a, he's a devout Catholic, but also a disciple of uh, St. Thomas Aquinas, the angelic doctor, the, you know, this, this premier, the, the most important theologian and, and philosopher in the church's history. And if St. Thomas Aquinas is quite rightly called the angelic doctor, um, I think we can write, quite rightly call Dante the angelic poet so what do we see we we, we, we talked uh, in our in our episode on the authority of the holy bible um about the three faces of man that are shown to us by scripture anthropos homo viator and homo superbus we see this in the divine comedy um so we see um anthropos he who looks up in wonder um it's while Dante, the character in the story, is in the dark with a sin that he looks up and sees Mount Purgatory and desires to escape from the darkness of sin in which he's trapped. So, it, and, and of course, the, the look up. So, you, you, we look up from hell to 
purgatory. We look up from purgatory to heaven. We ascend into heaven. We continue to look up until we go through this hierarchy of saints. And then we, and then we come and we see the, 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 the mother of Christ, the Blessed Virgin, and then she in turn points to the beatific vision of the trin Trinitarian God, the triune God with the figure of, of the incarnate God within it, this mis mystical moment at the climax of the poem. So it's all about looking up ultimately to God himself, uh, Anthropos, he who looks up, one aspect of who we are, from the Greek word Anthropos for man, as in anthropology, homo viator, man on a journey, because this is very much man on a quest. Dante, we have Dante the poet, but you also have Dante the character who the poet puts into his poem. So Dante is, first of all, there's an element of, if you like, autobiography, self-reflection. Dante's looking at himself uh, when he puts himself into the story. But there's also another sense in which Dante, the character in the poem, is an everyman figure. He represents all of us. Um, so uh, Homo Viator, man on a journey. And of course, the journey, the odyssey, the quest that Dante's on is from the dark wood of sin, descending through hell, ascending Mount Purgatory, and then ascending into paradise, into heaven. That's the journey. So this is man as man on a journey, man on a quest, the quest for heaven, man on a pilgrimage, a, 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 a following Christ, aiming for heaven. And then you have Homo superbus, the proud man who refuses the journey. And of course, we see these, the mirror to that held up to us, first of all, with Dante at the beginning and the dark wood of sin, but also with the souls in hell who have chosen uh, pride and selfishness over the quest. Um, they've chosen themselves and they have nothing now but themselves for eternity, uh, exiled by themselves from the presence of God. So Homo Superbus, Anthropos, Homo, homo Viata, Homo Superbus, the divine comedy shows us who we are. We also have to be aware, and again, this goes back to our episode on the authority of the Bible, that Dante insisted that his own work should be read allegorically in the same way that Thomas Aquinas teaches that the Bible should be read allegorically with four levels of meaning, the literal meaning, the uh, allegorical meaning, how the Old Testament relates to the new, the moral meaning, how what's in scripture relates to us as individuals and what we should do, and then the uh, anagogical meaning, how all of it relates to eternity. Dante states specifically in, in a letter that his poem should be read in the same way that Thomas Aquinas says the scripture should be read. So this should be a spiritual experience, which is going to teach us a great deal morally about ourselves and about our neighbor and keep us in mind of the four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell, eternity. Now, one of the things I want to say about the way that Dante is often misread and mistaught, so often uh, in uh, an academic environment, whether it's high school or college, when Dante is taught or read, it's only the inferno that's read. It's only hell that's read. Uh, and this is scandalous. And there's some sort of myth, some sort of misunderstanding that it's because it's superior to the other two books of the Divine Comedy. That is absolute nonsense. Um, uh, it, it emphatically is not superior. It's, it, it, it's, it's part of the whole. The analogy I sometimes use is to only read the inferno to the exclusion of the purgatorio and the Paradiso uh, is to only read the Fellowship of the Ring uh, and not the Two Towers or the Return of the King as regards the Lord of the Rings. These are, it's not a trilogy. The Lord of the Rings is called a trilogy. It's not a trilogy. It's one work with, 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 with different parts. And the Divine Comedy is exactly the same thing. The whole purpose of the Divine Comedy is to get Dante to the presence of, of, of God in the beatific vision in heaven, to cut him off when he gets down to the bottom of hell in the presence of Satan, uh, is obviously to miss the whole point and in a very deep way. So if we're going to read the Divine Comedy, read all of it. Uh, if we're going to teach the Divine Comedy, teach all of it. If the objection might be, well, we don't have time to teach all of it. Uh, if that's the case, don't just read the Inferno. Either read one of the others instead, the Purgatorio or the Paradiso, not the Inferno, or do what I do. You know, each uh, the 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 the, um, the inferno has uh, 
34 uh, um, sections to it, um, canti to it. Um, the the um, Purgatorio and Paradiso have 33, so there's 100 in total. You know, if, if you've only, only, only got time to teach one, I, I what I do is I teach about 10 of the cantos from each part, so 10 from the Inferno, 10 from the Purgatorio, 10 from the Paradiso. So obviously you're missing bits out, but at least you've got the structure of the whole poem in mind and you've got it in balance and you've got the direction the poem's going, which is basically you only go descending the head in order to ascend out of hell towards heaven. So that's a very, very important lesson we need, we need to know. Another very, very interesting thing is about Dante's Italian. You know, uh, we often think that, uh, at least I often thought until I learned better, that Dan, Dante's Italian is going to be very difficult and very different from modern Italian. You know, the, the parallel would be uh, Chaucer's, you know, Middle English from modern English. You know, and if you think Shakespeare is a little bit difficult, Chaucer's more difficult. So you think, well, Dante's Italian is even earlier than Chaucer's English, therefore it's going to be very difficult to understand. In actual fact, the Italian language has changed much less uh, during that period of what is it that 800 years now um from the um uh 700 years now my math isn't very good that's why i do literature um that uh the the, the, the language has changed so much in that time uh the english language compared with the italian and the, the, an italian scholar told me that um that the better analogy is that dante's italian is a bit like shakespeare's english so uh, it hasn't changed anywhere near as much as as the English language has at the same time. So one of the one of the uh, motives for us to 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 learn Italian, I would suggest, is not merely so we can be good tourists or good pilgrims when we go to Italy or Rome, but that we can read Dante's Divine Comedy in the original language. Of course, if we can't do that, then we are we have no choice but to read it in uh, translation. And then we have difficulties because uh, T.S. Eliot said in his poem, The Hollow Men, between the potency and the existence falls the shadow. In other words, between the potential and the power and the existence, a shadow falls. And that's certainly true of translation between the potency and the power of the original language and the translation of it, a shadow falls. It's never going to be as good as the original. But obviously you want it to be as good as possible. One of the difficulties that translators have is that, that um, Dante invented a rhyme scheme for the Divine Comedy called Terza Rima, uh, means third rhyme, which requires that not just having what, you know rhyming two words, two lines, you have to rely on three all the time and then interconnecting so it makes like a chain link fence in the form. It gives it very robust, very strong, uh, almost say very masculine uh, feel to the form of it. Most translators of the poem into English don't even try to translate the Tetsurima uh, uh, because it's easier to rhyme in Italian than it is in English. Um, so they don't try because the rhymes would be forced. This is, however, one of the reasons my favorite translation of the Divine Comedy is that by Dorothy L. Sayers. And she does keep to the Tetsu Rima. And it does mean occasionally the rhymes are forced or bad. But it does also give us, gives us the feel for the form of the poem, the actual structure, the feel, the architecture of it. We're seeing it uh, formally in that way. And I think that's important because Tetsu Rima is a very robust uh, poetic form. Uh, so the other thing about it is because Dante doesn't write about fictional characters, but about real historical people, many of whom would have been well known in his own day, but not very well known at all today. To understand the poem in its depth, in, at its deepest, we, we need to have a, 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 an edition which has very good notes, a very good annotation. So we get, we get, the, get the context as to who these people were uh, why would why 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 has Dante put this particular person in a hell and this particular person in purgatory and this particular person in 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 heaven? And of course, those in heaven are almost universally those that are canonized. That's an easy choice. There are a few exceptions. Uh, there, he, we could question and perhaps should question up to a point the, the extent to which Dante is being judgmental. 
uh, in, in placing fitness and people in hell. It's not for us to, to make that judgment. I think we do need to give him poetic license, even when he gets it wrong. <laughs> and we know he's got it wrong, at least one example, because uh, he puts uh, a, pope, a pope in, 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 in hell for what he calls the great refusal. Uh, and that was, uh, it's almost universally believed that he's referring to his contemporary, uh, Celestine V, who resigned from the papacy, very holy, very holy man, but was very unsuited to for, for the responsibility of being Pope and was being manipulated and used by, by cynical secular rulers with disastrous consequences. So he resigns from the papacy. Uh, and in consequence, the person who's elected in his place is someone who Dante considers an enemy. Uh, so in his anger or disgust at this resignation, uh, he places Celestine V in hell. The problem with that is that the Catholic Church has subsequently canonized Celestine V. <laughs> so Celestine V is actually a saint. So we know that, that Dante placed at least one saint in hell. This is all. This is really mentioned mostly, apart from the fact that I hope it's interesting because it's funny. What it shouldn't do is deter us from wanting to read the poem or to detract us from its merits. It's brilliant, and and we we, we uh, the fact that Dante uses real people rather than imaginary characters gives a realism to it, uh, particularly a pertinency, especially to his own time, uh, that would not be there otherwise. But. Uh, I'm going to go through some of the characters in the poem, who are also, of course, historical figures, but they're characters in the poem. The most important is Dante himself, who puts himself in the poem. And as, as I've said already, he is both himself. In other words, this is self-reflection. It's quasi-autobiographical. But it's also, uh, he's our representative, right? He represents all of us. He's an everyman figure. So his journey is our journey. We are all homo viator together. We're all homo superbus together, right? The battle between good and evil fought out each individual human heart between the homo viator we're called to be, the homo superbus we're tempted to be. Uh, and we're all meant to be keeping our eyes on heaven, looking up, anthropos. So Dante, it's doing what he's doing, is doing what all of us should be doing, okay, and are doing. All right, so uh, Virgil, who's Dante's guide through uh, hell and purgatory, um, is uh, really a symbol. First of all, he's Dante's mentor. We discussed Virgil in the earlier episode. Uh, clearly, the Aeneid by Virgil is a major inspiration. Uh, it's particularly the uh, vision of the afterlife and the judgment of the dead that we see in, in, in the Aeneid by Virgil is uh, a source of inspiration for Dante in his divine poem, in divine comedy. And clearly, Dante reveres Virgil as the greatest poet. Um, so Virgil is, 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 is a symbol not just of poetry, not just of, of brilliance in that sense, but he's also a symbol of human reason. The furthest that human reason that can, 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 can get us without the additional help, help of divine revelation. How far can the human mind go uh, towards God uh, without God himself revealing himself to us? Um, so obviously when Christ reveals himself to us, uh, we we let we overnight <laughs> with the gospel understand who god is the sort of god who god is and our relationship with that god much much better than would be possible if christ had not revealed himself to us in the gospel but without that we can still come to a pretty good understanding that there must be a god there must be some sort of order the the, the pagan uh philosophers plato and aristotle came up with the triune splendor of the good, the true, and the beautiful, which is a manifestation in, in of the Trinity in some sense. So we can go so far. So Virgil does that. He he understands sin, so he can descend into hell and show us the levels of our own sin, our own pride. Um, he can then ascend Mount Purgatory because it's still dealing with sin, but now the repentance of sin and the forgiveness of sin. But Dante cannot take, uh, uh, sorry, Virgil cannot take Dante up into heaven because human reason does not have access to the glory and mystery of heaven without it being revealed to us by Christ. Then we have Beatrice as, the, in some sense, the God-bearer. Symbolically, she, she, she's one who, who brings God uh, to Dante. So she, she's been compared with the Eucharist, with the church, with grace, and perhaps with the Blessed Virgin. Um, uh, but there's an aspect, I think, of the poem which is part of Dante's ascent 
to and 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 the divine comedy is an ascent in both senses of the word an ascent as in a s s e n t saying yes to grace and to goodness and truth and beauty but also an ascent a s c e n t uh climbing towards god uh through his grace and with our cooperation with that grace um part of dante's ascent to the will of god uh and his ascent towards god is the purification of his love for beatrice so at the beginning of the story his love for beatrice is perhaps as much as she's been a good influence on him uh as nonetheless it's sullied shall we say by an element of eroticism by impurity and perhaps he has to have his love for her purified purged and and this and this journey is is how that happens but she's some you know, an image of the divine feminine of the eternal feminine she's one of the most powerful female figures in all of literature in all of culture and then we have uh, that the characters we now have the places so the, the story begins in the dark wood the dark wood of sin uh in in the middle of dante's life dante to use modern parlance modern terminology is having a mid life crisis uh he's lost the plot he's not um focused on on the things that matter um he's lost his bearings he's lost his orientation he's lost so he's in the dark wood of sin in, in this midlife crisis and he can't escape and the reason he can't escape is every time he tries to, to to get out to find his way out of the dark wood of sin he's prevented from leaving by three ravenous beasts uh the leopard the lion and the wolf each of which symbolize different types of sin so he can't escape the dark wood of sin because the beasts of sin that he's now in, uh, trapped by he's trapped by his own sinfulness and that prevents him escaping from the dark wood in which he's lost he needs help and we might remind ourselves of of, of beowulf the last episode how how beowulf shows us of the need uh, that that uh, for, for for god's grace in the fight against evil well that's exactly what's needed here and we have this wonderful hierarchy of grace the hierarchy of, of, of the saints the communion of the saints the saints in communion with each other the communion of love with each other so dante's lost the the uh the process of 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 uh, of rescuing him the rescue mission if you like because that's what it is is set in place by the blessed virgin and the blessed virgin calls upon saint lucy another female saint um and saint lucy as her name signifies looks being the latin for light lucy is the patron saint of the blind for those who can't see dante is blinded by sin he can't see clearly he's lost so the patron saint of the blind saint lucy is sent by the blessed virgin to beatrice to the woman whom dante loves and the woman who loves dante although her love for him is much more is much holier uh, uh and and more pure than his for her and it's and it's she that takes the trip from heaven uh into uh uh the uh, the highest reaches of hell the ante chamber uh to 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 see virgil and and she that uh asks virgil to go on the mission to the dark wood and uh, uh rescue uh dante so we have this hierarchy the blessed virgin saint lucy beatrice virgil and in order to escape from the dark wood of sin dante and we have to look ourselves in the eye Well, how do we do that we have to look sin in the eye we have to understand the what sin is the destructiveness is the destructiveness of it both to us and to others so the only way out of the dark wood of sin is to descend into hell uh, abandon all hope all ye that enter here unless of course you're being rescued <laughs> from the dark wood of sin on a divine mission uh that was instigated by the blessed virgin in which case you will go through hell and see it without being damned by it so the damned as dante says uh following st thomas aquinas following the great philosophers following reason are uh 
the damned are those who have lost the good of intellect. All right, to sin is to abandon reason. And that's because the good, the true, and the beautiful are united as one, as a triune splendor. The goodness of love is can never be divorced from uh, the uh, from the uh, the truth of reason. The two are indissolubly married: faith and reason, love and reason. So, uh, sinners of uh, basically, sin is madness. Uh, the only true sanity is sanctity. So the, the damned are those who've lost the good of intellect. They've abandoned their reason for appetite um, or for malice. So uh, when we descend through hell, we get to the uh, very bottom of hell, which is at the center of the earth. We find Satan devouring for eternity um uh the worst of the sinners and satan is the center of gravity this is actually this great humor here gk chesterton said the angels can fly because they take themselves lightly whereas the devil fell by the force of his own gravity right to be homo superbus to be proud is to take ourselves far too seriously to think that we are god and we can decide what's right and wrong and we can do our own thing to so take ourselves much too seriously with very self-destructive consequences so right at the bottom of hell is the is the is the person who takes himself far too seriously the devil who falls by the the, the weight of his own gravity and then we emerge from hell and one thing we need to say here: where does where is where does Dante find himself? Or sorry, when is Dante find does Dante find himself in the, the dark wood of sin? On the evening of Maundy Thursday, Holy Thursday, he descends into hell on Good Friday. Right? What what we do when we sin? We nail Christ to the cross, and we nail ourselves to the cross, to our own cross, and we nail others to the cross. So he descends on Good Friday. And then uh, Holy Sa Holy Saturday, and then he emerges from, climbs out of hell to the foot of Mount Purgatory. He can see the stars again, see the the, 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 the goodness of God's creation, the stars above his head, Anthropos looking up, and he, that this happens on Easter Sunday morning. He looks once more at the stars, at God's creation. He rises from the dead. Um. And then we arrive halfway up Mount Purgatory at St. Peter's Gate. And we normally think of St. Peter's Gate as the gate to heaven. And again, this is Dante being a good theologian uh, because uh, Purgatory is heaven, right? It's the one-way street. It's where we, get, where we take a shower before we, before we enter into the presence of God, uh, where, we, where, we, where we are purged and cleansed of our sins. So uh, the, the three steps to St. Peter's Gate the first is of white marble that's so shiny it's like a mirror. This is the examination of conscience. This follows exactly the, the Catholic sacrament of penance, the confession. So we look at ourselves, the first step in the mirror, this white marble polished, an examination of conscience. The next ste step, the three steps to St. Peter's Gate is black and it's cracked in both directions. So the crack forms a cross. And this is contrition to see the consequences of our sins in the crucifixion of our Lord. And then the third one is redder than spurting blood. It's the satisfaction, the blood of Christ, the blood of the lamb is enough to purge us of our sins. If we have uh, contrition for those sins, having examined our conscience. So having gone through this process of confession according to the sacraments we enter uh, upper purgatory and then from that moment onwards dante pleads for mercy and beats his breast thrice three times remind us of the mass we do it in the mass three times mea culpa mea culpa mea maxima culpa through my fault through my fault through my most grievous fault or domine non sum dignus in, in the in the traditional mass three times domine non sum dignus domine non sum dignus Domine non sum dignus, Lord, I am not worthy, Lord, I am not worthy, Lord, I am not worthy. Mea culpa and domine non sum dignus is what's on the lips of Dante as he then ascends Mount Purgatory. He, seven P's are put on his forehead. P 
P for peccata, for sin in Latin. And as they reach new levels, each of those seven sins, those seven deadly sins is erased. And at the top of Mount Purgatory is the earthly paradise, that place of primal innocence where we get back to our unsullied, unstained Edenic, you know, the Adam and Eve, unfallen Adam and Eve state. And it's only when we reach that state of purity, we can then ascend uh, into heaven, into the presence of Christ and his saints. It's interesting in, 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 Mount, uh, on the, in the earthly paradise, Dante is, is presented over the pageant of the church, salvation history, and the blessed sacrament, which, which uh, is uh, based upon the Corpus Christi procession. So it's very sacramental, very Eucharistic. Um, then when Dante uh, 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 sends into heaven, the spokesman for the wise, spokesman of, of, of wisdom of the wise is not surprisingly and appropriately enough, St. Thomas Aquinas, Dante's own mentor, philosophically and theologically. Aquinas uh, waxes lyrical about St. Francis and his wedding, his marriage to Lady Poverty. And then Bonaventure waxes lyrical uh, about St. Dominic. And this, uh, this is reconciliation. There are tensions in Dante's time between the two, new, two newly founded orders that had only been founded earlier in the century or uh, in the previous century, the Dominican order and the Franciscan order. And the Dominicans uh, and the Franciscans were often, uh, there's a tension between them. So what does Dante do? He has St. Thomas Aquinas, a Dominican, praising St. Francis, the founder of the Franciscans. And he has St. Bonaventure, a Franciscan, praising St. Dominic, the founder of the Dominicans. There are no civil wars in heaven. There is true peace and reconciliation. And then as, as Dante gets higher and higher, in the various circles of of uh, of um, of heaven, he's examined in faith by Saint Peter. He's examined in hope by Saint James, and he's examined in love by Saint John. And then we see right at the end, Dante's love for Beatrice is purified and perfected. And then Dante beholds the Blessed Virgin, and the Blessed Virgin herself turns as they all turn towards the beatific vision to the vision of christ within the trinity uh and dante as great a poet as he is uh, has to confess at this point that words fail him even the greatest poet cannot show the beatific vision it can just suggest it the great uh catholic novelist convert morris Baring said that if great art is defined by by how it is finished how it is ended, then the Divine Comedy is the greatest work of art ever because of the way that it ends with the beatific vision. The whole of the poem is an ascent to this climactic moment. So, and, and then T.S. Eliot, the greatest poet of the 20th century, said of Dante that, um, that he's just been reading, he used to carry a copy of Dante in the original Italian round in his pocket. And he said, whenever I return to Dante and read Dante, I feel so inferior in his presence that all I feel I can do is to point to him and be silent. And that's what I'm going to do now at this point, at the end of this episode of The Authority. I am going to point to the next episode, which is on the Sir Gawain and the Green Knight poet. Uh, and until then, thank you for joining me in The Authority. And until next time, goodbye and God bless. This has been an episode of The Authority with Joseph Pierce, brought to you by TAN. For updates on new episodes and to support The Authority and other great free content, visit theauthoritypodcast.com to subscribe and use coupon code AUTHORITY25 to get 25% off your next order, including books, audiobooks, and video courses by Joseph Pierce on literary giants such as Tolkien, Chesterton, Lewis, Shakespeare, and Belloc as well as Tan's extensive catalog of content from the saints and great spiritual masters to strengthen your faith and interior life. To follow Joseph and support his work, check out his blog and sign up for email updates and exclusive content at jpierce.co. And thanks for listening.